And some of you may recognize this image, many of you may not. This is actually the Abrahamic Family Center in Abu Dhabi. It's about an hour and a half from my house. And it is a park, I guess you would call it, a garden, um, and also a cultural and religious understanding center where three houses of worship for the three main monotheistic religions have been built on the same complex. So these three cube-like structures are each one each, a church, a mosque, and a synagogue. I think it may be the first time in the world that they've ever been built like this um, together, and certainly in the Arab world, as you can imagine, this is like a landmark event. My husband and I actually got to visit the Abrahamic Family Center on our wedding day. We stopped there and, and toured before we went and got our paperwork done at the courthouse. Um, so it's a really amazing, incredibly peaceful and uh, marvelous project. But I put this image here because to me, like this is kind of a symbol of what brings us all together is we have these three great traditions. We call them monotheistic because for the last few thousand years, they've understood God as one source, um, primarily through male or masculine imagery. Um, but at, we can also look at them as being, as this particular project is called Abrahamic. And that is also problematic. And we'll get into that in a moment. Um, there's a different way to think about that that I think some of you might find refreshing and, and inspiring. And, uh, but ultimately at the end of the day, these three faiths and their kind of a, an umbrella of terms, right? For many others, um, you know, I know Melanie, we have, you know, you're from a, a Mormon background and we may have some others, you know, I, I don't know for sure, like your tradition may see itself as being kind of set apart from those. There may be other like groups here that see themselves as not quite maybe part of one of these or part of them. It can get very complex with all the subcategorization, but at the end of the day, <laughs> everyone is pointing back to this set of ancestors, Avraham and Sarah being the sort of quintessential founding couple or the the original couple of this um, of this lineage and we received gifts potentially from growing up within one of these three or a related tradition. And we might also have received what we felt were not gifts at all or terrible gifts, right? Or wounding that happened. And in reality, this tends to happen with two different parts of us um, as women, because for the last, what, few thousand years, I mean, it is not called the Abrahamic tradition for nothing, right? The forefather, the masculine, um, member of that union of Avraham and Sarah is the one that is remembered in the name of the tradition, right? That tells us something. And so as women, we've grown up in a context where it the the tradition is about, you know, Avraham and then Isaac and Jacob. And uh, we, we, we learn primarily about the forefathers, the foremothers are kind of in the background. And um, it is men and, you know, masculine beings who are primarily at the forefront of the tradition. Um, the language that's used for God is masculine. And there is often across all three traditions, a tendency, especially in historical documentation for there to be a considerable amount of fear around the feminine, feminine emotion, feminine language, um, the feminine as a way of understanding the human experience with God, uh, goddess, all of these things kind of went out the window for historical reasons that I think most of us here have probably done at least some digging in, and many of you are probably experts <laughs> in how all that went down. So we're not going to focus on that. But the point is, we have um, a feminine body, which has two portals, the lips or the mouth, um, which is the voice, and also the sort of vulva, which is kind of that opening to the vagina or the womb space, the yoni, if you prefer to call it. These are two creative portals at either end of the feminine body, and they have been severely restricted by the norms of these three traditions that we've grown up in and anything else that's kind of grown up around them. So these are the most, these are the portals of feminine magic. And if the word magic doesn't work for you, feminine power, feminine mystery, mystique, what, however you want to say it, um, energy. These are two portals of the feminine that have been most affected by the patriarchal teaching. And 
any of you here who are currently in leadership or you've been you find that people maybe are coming to you seeking guidance or that you have a sense that you are called in some way to that in the future have probably experienced this where uh you know there can be blockages or challenges even when you think that speaking up is going to be easy or that oh i'm ready to say this or i'm ready to own this identity or i'm ready to like talk about the divine mother or something like that you say that but then when you go to do it oh it's a lot harder, more challenging, you get more pushback than you expected. Or like in my case, when I the first time I actually talked about my journey into understanding God as feminine, I basically like my entire business collapsed. Um, and I lost all my income streams overnight. It was an incredibly intense and scary experience. Now I'm very grateful it happened. Um, but it was pretty extreme. So that may have happened to you or you may have had maybe something a little less dramatic, but still there's been a lot of pushback. And then also with the birthing, right, the yoni, or the the um, the vagina, the energy of the womb is um, not just about sexuality, but also about creativity and about birthing anything into the world. And so if you found it difficult to birth a program, birth a project, um, a birth a community, maybe you, you're called to create art or to create music, but you find that birthing it is difficult or you get easily distracted or stuck or it just doesn't happen, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a lot of times that experience is coming back to what the blockages that are happening in our body because of you know messages often subconscious that we received about the feminine growing up embedded in especially in our sacred texts and in the religious teaching that we received so what happens well this may not have happened to everyone but for myself and for a lot of the women that i've spoken with over the last five years we have in a sense even if we haven't fully left a tradition some of us have some of us haven't but in our in our bodies in our souls we have become essentially nomads and exiles at some level in order to find our way back to her to goddess to divine feminine to the eternal feminine because the subconscious you know understanding is if I need to look for her I need to go outside of my tradition because my tradition does not honor her never has you know God is male no other gods before me um people were you know punished for worshiping the golden calf which was a feminine you know goddess symbol uh yeah, yeah you know the people who worshiped the goddess in the temple were cast out etc cetera, etc cetera. all that those stories and those ideas have an effect and um, we we have this idea that you know I have to leave and actually the collapse of my business and um, so many people in my wider community like just abruptly leaving my world you know when I first made this declaration perhaps a bit naively made this declaration um, was kind of like this in my case it was this extreme projection of my mental expectation that if I want to pursue her. I have to do so in isolation outside of the, my community of origin and with the, you know, kind of a sense of shame. Like I have to have that, you know, that mark. It's like the scarlet letter or whatever that I have to wear around. Um, and this leads to all kinds of things. There can be a sense of isolation. Maybe it's not, you know, that you actually wake up in the morning and you feel like you're alone, but maybe you are still participating in some way in your community of origin, um, but you kind of feel awkward and separated even when you're sitting in a crowd of people it can be something like that or it can be literal isolation silence how much do i say do i say anything um can i bring the divine mother into my work how do i do that can i do it at the fullest extent that i am devoted to her in my spirit etc cetera, etc cetera. um sexual issues challenges and i realize everyone experiences sexuality differently so what is a challenge for you might not be for someone else based on preference or desire but the point here being at whatever way you wish to express your sexuality sexuality or to have a sexual experience or experience of intimacy. A lot of times there can be blockages or challenges that arise. There certainly were for me. I've written about that elsewhere. Happy to talk to anyone about that, you know, who'd like to know more. But I dealt with that um, all throughout my 20s, actually. And I had no idea that ultimately it stemmed back to uh, a lot of what I had been taught about sexuality in the female body in my upbringing. Um, fear of men or anger at men, inability to have a really healthy connection with a man. Um, that can stem out of this anger, hiding, people pleasing, uh, you know, can also be parts of this pattern that come out of this sense of, ex you know, exile and isolation and also wandering. Now, many of us end up on a beautiful time of spiritual wandering or we become nomadic in our lifestyle as part of 
rebirthing our consciousness and all of that. This is not the type of wondering I'm talking about. If you're called out onto one of those journeys, I certainly went on one for several years where I like downsized my life into a suitcase and traveled and, and it was part of this rebirthing season. Awesome. In this case, I mean, spiritually wandering where you find yourself kind of going from thing to thing into from community to community, looking for something, but you don't know what you're looking for. And maybe you find a little bit here that works for you and a little bit that works here, but you never can really settle in and feel like you belong somewhere else. That's an alternative for lack of a better term to what you had before. That's that sense of wandering, like, okay, I'm going to pick up my my spiritual suitcase and go again <laughs> in some way, because this is kind of my thing, but not really my thing. Melanie says, oh, that's me. They see themselves as Christian. Oh, okay, great. Thank you, Melanie. That was from the, my comment about Mormons earlier. Um, and Melanie also says, whenever I do a threshold image, I see the red granite. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. I'll try to keep an eye on the comments. So yeah, so wandering is a big one. Now, the interesting thing about that is though, that we are not the first wanderers in the history of our tradition. So how do we find our way to a new place called home? Well, this is a beautiful question because it takes us back to those people we mentioned earlier, back at the origin, the, the mythologic figures may have lived, may not have lived, may have originally been actually divine parent figures. That's a whole other conversation. We'll get into that a bit later. But regardless, these individuals, Avraham and Sarah or Sarai originally, um, you know, they left and found their way to a new home. And it's kind of ironic because that sort of gives us a bit of a model for the journey that we have had to go on to find our way back into the feminine or into a place where we can integrate the feminine with our experience. So let's just do a little bit of geography, just briefly, Avraham and Sarah, they lived around 2000 BCE, give or take a few hundred years. We are not gonna get super specific here, but it was a long time ago. And the text tells us that they came from Ur of the Chaldees, which was in Sumer. And it's mind blowing to me that like when they dig cuneiform tablets, like those clay tablets that they dig out with the wedge style writing all over them, uh, or when they're you know excavating anywhere in this area and they dig those out, that that is the type of writing and the type of tablet, the type of system that would have been produced at the time that Abraham and Sarah were mm. walking the earth. It's completely mind blowing to um, to me to imagine that. And then what do they do? They go all the way through the Fertile Crescent. They're called out. The text tells us they're called out by by God. In this case, by God, as you know, Abraham comes to understand God, and they go to this land, Canaan which is supposed to be the promised land or it's a place of great blessing a place that they will be um they'll be prospered and we usually think about this from Avraham's perspective because he was the one who felt the call and went on the journey and of course Sarah being his wife and also his sister they had the same father, but different mothers. I think that's how it goes. Um, but that was common in that time. They, of course, went together. But here's the thing. We tend to think about this as they went to Canaan. They encountered Semitic people because this area would have been primarily settled by Semitic people, whereas, you know, here in their homeland, it was Mesopotamians. Um, we tend to think of them as, you know, the sort of Semitic group that they became. They went down into Egypt, came back out as the Hebrews and the Israelites, but that doesn't really account for the mothers, for the matriarchs. And these women were Mesopotamian. They came from a matrilineal society. They came from, as we'll see later, some of them were oriented towards societies where the youngest child would inherit instead of the eldest child. That helps us with the story of Rebecca, and we'll get into that later. Um, there were a lot of norms that were different, and there was a tradition already, an established tradition of priestess service in Mesopotamia. So the 
the suggestion I want to make is that you can take the matriarchs, the Hebrew matriarchs here, out of Mesopotamia, but you can't necessarily take Mesopotamia out of the matriarchs. And this is where our Sunday school lessons or our Hebrew school lessons did not um, probably take us to this, <laughs> take us to this place, because they uh, everything is oriented toward what what Avraham in particular was going into, the new relationship, the new way of understanding God, the, the 